thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you also to the organizers and the organizing committee to give me the opportunity to talk here. Um, I was looking forward to be again in Santa Barbara. I was there already, I think, two or three times uh, in the past, but unfortunately it was not to be. So um, I am giving my talk from the University of Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing, and it's, it will be midnight in about two minutes. So <clears throat> um, without further ado, let me just start. Um, I will talk about qualitative chirality effects in Kazimir Lifshitz's work. And this is a work I did together with uh, two of my uh, postdocs. Wynand uh, Brewer is my current postdoc at UCAS. And uh, Bing Sui Lu uh, was my postdoc when I was at the University of Ljubljana a few years ago. Um, I retired a few years ago also, and I'm spending time now um, in, in uh, Beijing. So uh, Bing Sui is working at the, just moved to the Department of Physics, Xi'an Jiao Tong Liverpool University in Suzhou. <clears throat> My background is um, colloidal interactions. So that means uh, interactions between uh, macromolecules or macromolecular surfaces. What you see here are two proteins heavily interacting, as you can see. Um, the interactions uh, on the colloidal level are usually divided into uh, van der Waals interactions, which are attractive, and electrostatic interactions, which are repulsive. And this division of interactions into these two terms is referred to as the <clears throat> DLVO theory, which stands for the Ryagin landau fervey overbeck theory. And um, Casimir is a kind of a connector between these two parts of the Deryagin landau fervey overbeck theory. Um, a few historical tidbits. Uh, Casimir, as far as I know, was the son-in-law of either Fervey or Overbeck. And as these two characters were writing their book on the colloidal interactions, uh, they gave him a problem to work on, which was to go beyond the so-called Hamaker approximation in the evaluation of van der Waals interactions between, let's say, two semi-infinite bodies or two membranes or two, uh, two spherical uh, macromolecules. And uh, this is how uh, it started. I, I think he published his paper on Casimir effect in 48. And uh, the, the writing of the book by Fervey and Overbeck was during the war, so 41 to 45, that's when he started to work on this problem. Not only that, he was involved also in the other component of the DLVO theory, in the Poisson-Boltzmann theory, which I indicated here. So he's connected on the one side to Van der Waals, on the other side, to Poisson-Boltzmann electrostatics. And I also uh, copied for you a part of the text from the book by Fervey and Overbeck, where they thank Casimir for his contribution to the book. And what he did is uh, what's today referred as the uh, Casimir, force, uh, Casimir um, charging process to evaluate the free energy of electrostatic interactions. I know that it's, it's uh, probably not something you're familiar with. It's not part of the Casimir physics, but Casimir was the person who nevertheless uh, did it. So he is very well connected with the colloidal part of van der Waals interactions from the very start, uh, we could say. Um, in the um, colloidal world, or in general, in the world of soft matter, there are many fluctuation interactions, not only uh, van der Waals um, slash Casimir interactions. There are all sorts of thermal effects, um, usually thermal fluctuations, not quantum fluctuations. And we refer to them as uh, <clears throat> the thermal Casimir effect. Let's say if you have membranes, undulating 
or if you have ions fluctuating, or you have some liquid crystals uh, mechanically fluctuating, all of these interactions are referred to as the thermal Casimir effect or thermal Casimir interactions. So um, specifically after Lipschitz proposed his theory in 54, it, uh, it was uh, very fast uh, picked up by the people in colloidal um, interactions community. And I'm showing you here on the left-hand side, the paper from 69 by Adrian Procedure. Adrian Procedure was my postdoc mentor at uh, National Institutes of Health, where I did my postdoc and later worked for many years. And uh, this is a paper on membrane, membrane interactions. So Van der Waals as a constitutive, Van der Waals interactions as a constitutive part of not only soft matter interactions, but actually biophysical interactions. So you see that they were using the full, um, full uh, frequency decomposition and uh, Lifshitz theory together with it to evaluate membrane membrane. It says thin lipid films, but that's what it means. So. I just wanted to point out that Van der Waals interactions are there from the start in colloid and bio nano colloid world. Uh, we all, of course, are familiar with the Lipschitz theory in one of its guises. Uh, one of the beautiful things about the uh, Casimir effect, Casimir physics, is that you can evaluate, calculate the same interaction by, by many different methodologies. So Lipschitz theory is just one, especially the first variant of it formulated within the read of fluctuational electrodynamics. There's of course other approaches, many other approaches, and I'm sure you will hear and already know a lot about that. So there's no need to go into this. Um, Fluctuation free energy, I have it in the familiar Lifshitz form, and it gives you the interaction. And from the interaction, of course, you will get the force between either uh, mole molecules or macromolecular arc aggregates or macroscopic bodies, actually. So that much about forces from the Lifshitz theory. But what about the torques? One could ask oneself, well, if we have uh, forces, in what kind of situation will we see torques between um, either molecules or um, macromolecular bodies, which is what I will be talking about also in my presentation here. So uh, the first time people started to think about Van der Waals uh, torques, was in the early 70s, and Yefin Katz was the first, actually, as far as I know, I have to say, uh, as, our, as far as I was able to, to find. He was the first to formulate theory of Van der Waals interactions in non-isotropic systems and showed that if a dielectric response uh, function is a tensor, that would lead, in general, to torques between uh, macroscopic bodies. Uh, his calculation from 71 was based on the uh, Lipschitz theory. He was solving the equations for the Green's function. Unfortunately, um, there were some errors committed and uh, that particular paper uh, did not withstand the, the test of time. Uh, it was not, uh, the, the, re the final result was not uh, correct. Uh, Yevin Katz later worked a lot in the physics of liquid crystals and actually wrote a, a very nice book on the fluctuation effects in liquid crystals. After him in 73 came Yuri Barash, a well-known uh, name, well-known uh, researcher in the field of Van der Waals torques. And he tried to reformulate the problem started by Katz in 73. Um, I assume you've heard of Barash. He was a student of Ginsburg, and he worked ex extensively on uh, Van der Waals interactions. Actually, he wrote a book on Van der Waals interactions, but maybe not that well uh, known. He was also directly solving Maxwell equations. And again, he made an error, which he himself later corrected in uh, his later work. So what these two guys were considering were two anisotropic crystal, crystals separated by an 
air layer, so uh, an isotropic layer. Uh, Katz also considered two isotropic, the reverse uh, case, two isotropic bodies separated by a cholesteric liquid crystal. Unfortunately, as I pointed out, the, the calculations were not entirely correct. Uh, later came uh, Adrian Precision with George Weiss in 72, and they actually, this, this is the correct solution for the non-retarded uh, problem of, of van der Waals storks. They were looking at two macroscopic bodies separated by vacuum with dielectric tensors, actually, um, uh, yeah, two, two dielectric tensors in each of the anisotropic body, bodies, uniaxial symmetry, and they calculated the non-retarded contribution to the free energy, and from that, they calculated the torque. This is still valid, valid work, uh, no error there. They were solving the Poisson equation, and because it's non retarded and from that free energy and torque. As I'm sure uh, you all know, Adrian Procedure also wrote a well-known book on van der Waals interactions where you can also learn about his uh, calculation of the torques. So after that, we go to the Barash work in 1977, where he corrected uh, whatever the error was in his previous work, but unfortunately also committed an error that later propagated through the literature all the way to, I think, 2005, when um, Jeremy Monday and uh, Federico Capasso and their, their collaborators, they realized that actually there's been a typo in all these formulas, and this is, uh, you know, it's it's not unheard of because if you look at these formulas, they're extremely complicated. It's, it's very, very easy to commit algebraic errors or just typos. And eventually this typo got corrected in 2008, as you can see in the erratum to this paper. And this is the theory of uh, um, van der Waals torque or Casimir torque between two bodies which have a non-isotropic dielectric response. Uh, and this is where we are. This is the standard still. Um, it involves heavy al algebra. It's not, it's not e uh, easy even to type it in uh, Mathematica to do some, some uh, numerical calculations, but this is now the correct form of the torque between two anisotropic bodies. And many people were using this in order to calculate van der Waals storms. My um, start in, in this particular direction was uh, actually with uh, Adrian, with Adrian Precision. We were looking at uh, uh, multilamellar systems. And at that time, the question uh, arose, what about, uh, you know, multilamellar um, system which are, systems which are non-isotropic? And uh, this is how we started or I started to work on this problem. So after this um, initial advance in the theory, of course, the question became, uh, can we experimentally see this kind of van der Waals torques? And in uh, 2018, so it took a while, it took a while, it's not an easy experiment, um, uh, but, uh, but the Jeremy Monday and his group measured the Casimir torque in a very special arrangement involving a liquid crystal and a birefringent crystal separated by a finite distance. The actual configuration used in this experiment was suggested by Smith and Ninham already in 1973 as a possible way to measure uh, van der Waals torque. Uh, unfortunately, as you can see, it took a long time to get really there experimentally. On the right-hand side, I'm also showing you a news and views uh, paper by uh, Dasha Zumer on this particular experiment. Uh, why am I showing you that? Because I got the idea that uh, maybe it's a uh, maybe it should be good to to or should be interesting to look not only at nematic liquid crystals, meaning that you have a direction, you have an uh, uh, uniaxial system, a dielectric system and you can calculate the torques between, let's say, two uniaxial systems. What if you have a cholesteric liquid crystal? And a cholesteric liquid crystal, of course, differs from an amatic liquid crystal by 
the fact that the direction of the axis rotates in space. So you can say you have thin layers of nematics where the direction, the principal direction of the dielectric tensor rotate around an axis as you move from one layer to the other one. And this is what actually Zoomer suggested in this News and Views article. You see it says it's also possible that the torque sensor could be made from a cholesteric liquid crystal. At that time, there were no calculations of that type. I mentioned that uh, Katz actually started uh, thinking in this direction, but unfortunately his calculation was not correct. So there was no, uh, nothing to build on actually in terms of, oops, Oh, uh, sorry, uh, something happened here. I have to go back. I pressed the wrong uh, button. Okay, hopefully you can still see it, right? Uh, if not, you will tell. So anyhow, cholesteric liquid crystals. Uh, maybe we should think about that. And this is what we actually started to think about. So this was the work uh, I started in 2009 with my postdoc at that time, Gregor Leblanc. Uh, we were looking at, uh, at uh, a system co composed of layers periodic in one direction. And the question is, what would be a good methodology to evaluate Van der Waals or uh, Lifshitz free energy in that particular geometry? And we found out that probably the best, best way to approach it is to write, not to solve Maxwell's equations in the usual form that you can see right here, but to transform them or rewrite them. There's no real transformation. You just rewrite them in a form of an eigenvalue problem right here. Z is the direction it, in which you have inhomogeneity inho, in of the dielectric uh, response function. So the green layer is uh, right here, green slab, and the red slab is down here. And you see that the, 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 the uh, directions of the dielectric tensor are displaced by an angle theta, which you have to take into account and evaluate the solution of Maxwell's equation. And that will give you eventually also the uh, Lifshitz free energy. This is a little bit different from the approach of Barash and all the works that follow from that approach because they solve the Maxwell's equations as they are. We reformulated them in an eigenvalue problem, which is particularly suitable for this kind of geometry. So, <clears throat> uh, on top of that, you can define a uh, propagator matrix. So you solve the, the linear equation, which corresponds to the Maxwell uh, equations in the direction of Z. Here you have the solution. P is called the propagator mat matrix and is the exponential of a diagonal matrix composed of the eigenvalues of the, of the equation right here of the eigenvalue equation. Yeah. And uh, the, 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 the uh, thing about this methodology that was really important for us, that it's very easy to find a solution of a sequence of slabs of finite thickness to, in order to obtain the uh, Van der Waals free energy right here. So this is the propagator matrix for a number of layers from zero to N, each one of them of thickness H0, H1, and so on. This is the total propagator matrix. And then you do some transformation. You have to take into account that uh, outside of this slab composed of N layers, the field should be decaying and you end up with the free energy, which is written right here. So you need to evaluate a subdeterminant of the original propagator matrix that gives you the Lipschitz free energy. There are other approaches basically equivalent to, to this one. And this is what we formulated together with Gregor in uh, 2009. Now, uh, does this approach give the same result as the Barash approach? Um, you would say, well, you calculate both of them and you see, are they identical or not? Well, it's not so easy, actually. There were people 
who, like Philbin and Leonhardt in 2008, who applied a different methodology, got a different result that they were not able to show analytically is equal to the Barash result, but is equal numerically. We were, however, able, and in fact, uh, 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 Wynant and Bing Sui Lu were able in 2019 to show actually analytically that what you get from the uh, propagator matrix formalism and the uh, eigenvalue solution is exactly equivalent to the Barras solution. And right here at the bottom, I'm showing you numerically the torque um, calculated. Uh, so the, the red points are calculated by the Barras methodology and the blue line is calculated by the eigenvalue problem. It's not easy to see that they are identical because the formulas are so complicated and uh, mathematics also doesn't help. So anyhow, these are two torques for two different anisotropic system. One is uh, barium titanate and calcium carbonate and barium titanate and a pneumatic liquid crystal called 5CB. Uh, Doesn't matter exactly what that is. It's a pneumatic uh, liquid crystal. So the torque, Van der Waals torque is defined in, of course, the standard way. And uh, you just calculate the free energy, get the torque, and uh, this is what you get. So the approach via the uh, reformulation of the Maxwell's equation based on the propagator matrix is equivalent to the Barras solution of the Maxwell equation, his green function and so on. So what we also need to realize that the dielectric anisotropy is not the only anisotropy you can have in the system. There is material, anisotropy, meaning dielectric tensor, and morphological an anisotropy, which means that the interacting bodies are uh, have a certain symmetry. Um, and here I'm showing you three different cases. So these are two slabs of uh, anisotropic dielectric, two slabs composed of cylinders, and two cylinders composed of um, anisotropic material. For each of these three cases, we were able to evaluate the torques. And the torques, as you can see, usually go as sine of two to phi. Phi is the angle between the orientations, either of the shape or of the dielectric tensor between the two interacting bodies. Um, so this is for two uh, semi-infinite spaces. This is for two semi-infinite spaces, which are full of um, cylindrical inclusions, and this, the final formula, are two cylinders interacting, but the cylinders are composed of anisotropic materials. And what you see here in the last formula is that the two anisotropies are not additive. So there's a cosine two theta, cosine theta, uh, cosine phi, divided by sine squared phi. This is not of this form, so the torque is more complicated, and it has one component that comes from the uh, dielectric anisotropy, so from material anisotropy, and another component that comes from morphological anisotropy. And um, so we have the torques for all these cases. I will not... Uh, um, bore you with these formulas, all of this can be calculated. And uh, in, in the case of retarded limit, all of these formulas are explicit. Uh, I mean, you can get everything analytic. Anyhow, let's go to, uh, to the final problem, which I really want to address. And that is the stratified media. I am again showing you that sentence from the News and Views paper uh, of Schumer, which was uh, um, dedicated to the experiments of uh, Monday et al. And he invokes the cholesteric liquid crystal as something that would be interesting to analyze in terms of what kind of torques can you get if one of the interacting bodies, or possibly both of them, are uh, chiral. This is what uh, cholesteric liquid crystal means. So here you see schematically what I'm talking about. You have one 
surface um, of finite thickness, which is anisotropic, and then you have many other ones, uh, other ones which are also anisotropic, but the axis of the uh, dielectric tensor is rotating. So the two neighboring layers are displaced by a delta theta. This was the original problem that we addressed with uh, Bing Sui Lu, and the idea of this so-called layer slabs of anisotropic material was to model uh, cholesteric liquid crystals. So I have uh, two examples of uh, cholesteric liquid crystals. You see the layers, and each of the layer is nematic, but the axis of this nematic rotates as you move through these layers. So you have an axis that turns around. The axis is assumed to be perpendicular to the edge of the layer. Here is another example of a cholesteric liquid crystals. There are many cholesteric liquid crystals. There are also biological cholesteric liquid crystals, which makes the whole endeavor worthwhile because you would be able to describe interactions between, let's say, uh, membranes with chiral inclusions or something like that. So we were excited to be able to, um, to start with this problem. The first case is a single anisotropic layer and then many other rotating anisotropic layers where the angle between the axis of two neighboring layers is delta theta. And uh, in this case, interestingly enough, you can evaluate uh, non-retarded free energy and non-retarded torques analytically. I'm just showing you here uh, that there are actual formulas that you can get for many, actually infinitely many of these layers with rotating dielectric axis. So this FSS means the interaction between two uh, first layer, the first layer in the, in the many uh, uh, layer system and the other layer of anisotropic uh, material. And the SR is the con contribution of all the other ones. Um, you can, of course, um, uh, calculate numerically what you get out of that. If I define the anisotropy right here, so the parallel and perpendicular component of the dielectric uh, tensor uh, of the layers as a function of frequency, and it turns out that if the anisotropy of C is small, so if this gamma is small, and I define gamma squared in this way, I can uh, get the torque explicitly. And you see that it has a standard sinusoidal form. Uh, the form is sine of two theta d. Theta d is the angle between two nearest layers. So the fur the 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 uh, single anisotropic layer to the left, and the first layer of the multilamellar system to the right. That's theta d. And I'm also showing you here with the uh, black dot dash line are just the two layers interaction. The other curves are a summation over all the n layers. What do we see? If the th delta theta, so the, the rotation of the optical axis from one layer to the other one is zero, the torque is the largest. Then pi over two, it gets smaller and then even smaller so for pi for pi over 10 and then even smaller for pi over two. Oh, Rudy, yeah. Yeah. Rudy, uh, yeah. We have uh, four minutes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, you 10 have... minutes, okay. So um, you also see a displacement, a shift in the angular direction, depending on the delta theta. So if delta theta is pi over two, you, set, you see the shift in the curves towards the right, proportional to uh, delta theta. Now, the same thing you can do for two multilamellar layers. So not one, but many on the left and many on the right. Very similar uh, results. Uh, again, there is, is a shift in the angular uh, direction, and there is a variation of the magnitude of the torque as a function of delta theta. So now to the um, 
retarded, the full retarded case. I have a system of N layers. The optical axis is rotating by delta theta from one layer to the other one. What is the interaction between, let's say, a single anisotropic layer to the left and this multilameral cholesteric, because you have a rotation of the axis uh, system to the right? So right here, first of all, uh, you can have these different cases. The first case would be uh, a single cholesteric liquid crystal with rotating optical axis. I will not go into details how to calculate that. It, uh, we use the uh, eigenvalue method, and you can derive explicitly all the formulas. But uh, also, of course, you have to assume a certain dielectric response for the um, cholesteric uh, liquid crystal. And we take the uh, literature values which are available. I will not go into details. It, it's just a model that we use to evaluate the torques. So this is the first uh, result of the calculation. A anisotropic crystal, barium titanate, right next to a cholesteric, either right-handed or left-handed cholesteric liquid crystal. So here you see the triangles are, if you don't have a, a cholesteric, but uh, if you have a nematic. And then the cholesteric basically leads to a shift in the position of the minima of the torque towards a finite value of, uh, of, uh, of the phi. Phi is, is the rotation between the crystal and the cholesteric liquid liquid crystal. Also, there's a little bit of a sub-story here. Uh, how many terms do you need to take in the Baker Campbell Hausdorff formula? Uh, this is a one, one uh, term. These are two terms and so on. And it turns out that two terms are usually enough. Uh, the third term doesn't contribute much. On the right, you see how the torque varies with the separation between the cholesteric liquid crystal and the barium titanate. So the highest curve, the strongest torque, is for small separation, like 380 nanometers, and the smallest one is for 800 nanometers. Plus, on top of that, you see that the torque for the cholesteric system, for the chiral system, decays slower than for the nematic system. So this is anisotropic crystal and a cholesteric liquid crystal. Now, let's talk about two cholesteric liquid crystals right next to one another. Of course, in this case, you can have a homochiral configuration and a heterochiral configuration. Homochiral means right-handed cholesteric is facing a right-handed cholesteric or left-handed facing left-handed. It turns out that they, uh, the torques are similar, but are again shifted by some angle um, uh, in the uh, angular direction. So basically the, the lowest order approximation is sinusoidal, but if you go to the first and the second contribution to the BCH formula, you will see that the dependence is not sinusoidal anymore. And this is like a generic thing that we find that in the case of two cholesteric uh, crystals interacting, the interaction that the torque is not sinusoidal anymore. Also what we see that there are certain angles at which the torque changes sign as a function of the separation. So moving up and down here, you change the separation. And you see that you go from a positive torque to a negative torque. This is actually that something that's been observed also by Tiam and collaborators this year uh, for two anisotropic crystals. We see it for two cholesteric liquid crystals. Same effect, possibly measurable. Okay, um, so I have another few minutes. Uh, the other, the last uh, thing I will discuss is the heterochiral uh, cholesteric configuration. So you have a, a right-handed cholesteric 
facing a left-handed one or a left-handed one facing right-handed one. Of course, the torques and the interactions are the same, but it's interesting to see how this sameness comes about. And it turns out that in the BCH, in the Baker-Campbell Hausdorff formula, you need to go to at least to the second order for the two configurations to give you the same torque, exactly the same torque. And here I'm just showing you, so this would be uh, the torque, and you see that it's highly non-sinusoidal. This is at separation 10 nanometers, and what I'm showing you here is going from, again, 380 nanometers to 800 nanometers. And again, there's a, a shift, it's not sinusoidal anymore, plus the same effect as before at a certain uh, angle right here. If you change the separation between the two liquid crystals, you see that the torque also changes size. This should be measurable in principle, and I think it's one of the interesting effects that you can observe in this kind um, of systems. So here I am, uh, conclusions. Casimir torque for stratified anisotropic media. Uh, the results that we obtain uh, for, um, for uh, cholesteric liquid crystals are very different from pneumatic or birefringent plates. These results have been described in details in this paper, 2021. Uh, you can take a look at it if you are interested. Um, so uh, one of the things is that uh, the, there is a shift in the angular dependence of the torque by about plus minus pi over two when you go from uh, left-handed to right-handed cholesteric. So it depends on the chirality of the liquid crystal. At very short uh, distances, about 10, nanometer, uh, 10 nanometers, there is a big deviation from the sinusoidal shape that you see in the standard Barash calculation for um, two anisotropic crystals. So there's no sinusoidal dependence anymore. It's much more complicated. Um, we believe or hope that the birefringent liquid crystal configuration is experimentally accessible uh, based on the experiments by the Monday group. And uh, possibly this kind of experiments is feasible too. Um, and there is the phenomenon of the change of sign uh, of the torque as you change the separation between the two cholesteric liquid crystals at a fixed angle of uh, mutual uh, orientation. So that's uh, pretty much it. These are the main conclusions of our work and uh, thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you, Rudy. We have time for a few questions, please. Use the microphone for records and, and the Zoom, please. Okay, uh, <clears throat> thank you for this uh, nice uh, uh, speech. And uh, uh, I, uh, going back to slide 11, you presented uh, some, uh, uh, yes, a structure with the cylinders that are uh, anisotropic. Uh, uh, do you use uh, an effective medium uh, theory to uh, to have the um, dielectric constant of uh, ah. the, the system? And yes. then, if you use it, as you are going to, uh, to 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 use all the frequencies to compute the torque, uh, what about the validity of this effective uh, theory uh, when you are uh, moving uh, through frequencies? Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for the question. Of course, uh, interesting question. You have to use some kind of effective field theory and you can see here, I'm not sure, can you see uh, my uh, pointer now? Can you see it? Maybe I should go back to uh, here, to presentation. So here, uh, this V is the volume fraction of the cylinders. And uh, what we use at the effective medium theory is the what's referred to as the Rayleigh formula for cylindrical composite. Of course, you can use other formulas. I think we checked two at the depth times and there was no, <clears throat> there was no appreciable difference. But of course, you have to assume some effective medium field. Yes, you have to take a model. 
And we assume that for all the frequency, it rem uh, the frequencies, it remains the same. <clears throat> Did I answer um, your question? Yeah, yeah. Hi, Rudy. This is Lillian Hi. Woods. Ah, hello. Um, hello. Excellent talk, as usual. Thank I have you. a few questions. My first question is, do thermal fluctuations matter for the Casimir torque? My first question. My second question, um, to what do you attribute this change of sign in the torque? To what degree can you attribute this to the dielectric properties of the materials? In other words, do I expect this change of sign always, or there are some situations when it occurs and in other situations when it doesn't? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the questions. So the first question was thermal fluctuations. You mean the Matsubara zero frequency, right? Right? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. So, yes, of course, there is a contribution of the zero frequency term. And uh, it depends of, uh, on what kind of dielectric model, of course, you take uh, as, as a model description of the cholesteric. So, we, uh, as I said, we used uh, a model. Um, I mean, it's based on the actual data for, for uh, uh, let, me, let me get to that. Uh, where is that? Uh, all right, not here, not here, not here, here, yeah. So we use the 5CB uh, liquid crystal, which is an amatic, and the doped with the chiral dopant S811. And we just uh, lifted the data from the literature. You see here in yellow, uh, down here, the two papers that we uh, exploited and just use the parameters that they have there. And you can see that there is a, an isotropy also at zero frequency. So to your question, to, the, to your first question, I would say, yes, there is a contribution of the zero frequency. And the second question was, I think, the question regarding the change of sign of the torque right here. Uh, I think you're referring to this change of sign. It depends very much on the pitch of the cholesterol. This, I would say, is the most important parameter. And now I, I have to admit, you know, I didn't explicitly say it here, but our calculation is done for infinitely large, so, so there's an infinite number of pitches in the calculation. And this is, um, we have to do it better. We are working on a finite size of the cholesteric and only then will I be able to tell you exactly what is the status of this effect. Will it persist for a finite layer or will it just go away as you, um, decrease the thickness of the sample. So we need to see. Okay, uh, Kimball Milton. Yes. Uh, thanks, Rudy, for such a great talk and uh, all Thank the you. historical review. Uh, so this is this is very interesting. I was I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about the possibilities of observing these really interesting torque effects uh, experimentally beyond what Monday has said. Yeah, so the fact that uh, Jeremy was able to measure this with the liquid crystal already, it was an amatic liquid crystal, and also, uh, I mean, Jeremy will correct me if I'm wrong, they use a certain approximation, I think they call it the boundary layer approximation, which basically means that the Dow, the, 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 the director of the uh, cholesterol, of the liquid crystal, rotates, you assume that its uh, direction is fixed, and the rationale for that is an old work by Persigian where he showed that there is only a certain um, region of the dielectric slabs that are interacting, which is, so to say, active in Van der Waals interaction. So in the boundary layer theory, you assume that it's only the first layer, the orientation of the first layer that uh, matters. But let's say you take two such liquid crystals, and instead of using the boundary layer approximation, you try to use one of the formulas that uh, we produced. I see, in principle, of course, 
uh, no, no uh, impediments to, to repeat this, uh, the Monday experiment, but with cholesteric liquid crystals. But of course, Jeremy is the person who, who will, will say whether this is something that's, that's feasible experimentally or there are just uh, difficulties which I cannot even foresee. Okay, uh, last question by Francesco Intravaya. Hi, Rudy, Francesco here. Hi, Francesco. Thank you very much for the talk. So I have uh, um, more than uh, uh, a question and then uh, um, two questions actually. One is again on the change of sign of the talk. Of the talk. Uh, so if I correctly understood, and this is um, uh, similar to what uh, the paper of Priya, Tiam and Kim also yeah. showed, uh, as a function of the distance, it seems that you change the range of frequencies that really matters for uh, your, uh, your system and therefore you have a change in the behavior of the anisotropy of your system. So this seems to be the reasons, or I will say probably would be the same reason that you have also in, uh, in uh, your system, and this could correlate uh, with uh, the information that you were saying about the pitch. So I don't know if this is the, the, my a correct interpretation of what uh, this change of uh, sun is. And uh, uh, my second question is, is there an unwaving explanation of, to understand why with cholesteric liquid crystal the uh, torque is not sinusoidal? Um, so uh, the first part is, uh, you are of course right, you, you have a frequency summation, so this is a full, as I said, full retarded theory, full frequency summation, everything is there, but on top of that, you have additional parameters, which is like pitch and, of course, the separation between the two. Okay, separation you always have. But the pitch is an important parameter here. I, apart from giving you the formula or giving you the graph, I'm not sure I am able to produce a hand-waving argument. Why, you know, why is this the case? And... Um, uh, in terms of the non-sinusoidal dependence, I know where it's coming from. It's coming from the higher order terms in the uh, BCH formula. So if you take the first order term, and I did not say much about that. It's a, li a little bit, you know, on the formal side, I didn't want to go into details. But the first order in B the BCH will always give you a sinusoidal contribution. And then as you go to higher order, orders, the, the, the sinusoidal uh, uh, dependence uh, vanishes. You get a much more complicated uh, dependence. And you, of course, will ask me, how do I know that the second order is enough? Why not third and fourth? And of course, they, they are more and more horribly looking. So the first, the, the first one is fine, second one also. And what we did then is you can do several tests. First of all, you do the integral of the torque over one full angle, and that has to be zero. If you cannot get zero, you have to go to a higher order. There's no doubt about that. And luckily, we were always able to show that within very reasonable accuracy, we get the integral of the full torque zero if you stop at the second order in the BCH form. So, it's the second order term. Now, do I have any more hand-waving argument for what does that mean? I'm not sure. I don't think so. Uh, we thank Rudy again. And